Many moons ago, I read a rather illuminating article from a Jewish author offering rabbinic insights regarding the third of the Ten Commandments given to Moses on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. Now, we all remember the third commandment, right? <laughs> Me neither. So here it is. Um, <clears throat> the third commandment was, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now, as a child growing up in the Christian faith, I had been led to believe that the third commandment was simply a general prohibition against flippant utterances of the word God or derivatives thereof, such as gosh or golly. But this article which I read in my young adulthood argued that the third commandment actually suggested something far more profound, something beyond merely identifying a narrow category of curse words. It noted that at least some Jewish scholars understood the third commandment to prohibit the lifting up of the name of God, either through worship or public profession, and then negating the power and meaning of God's name by acting in a way contrary to all that God's name stood for, thus making God's name worthless or of no effect. In, in other words, the third commandment was actually a prohibition against religious hypocrisy. To take the Lord's name in vain is to claim to be a person of God, but then to live in a completely ungodly way. So if this is how we are to understand the idea of taking someone's name in vain, then this past week, we had some very good examples, uh, both on a national and a local level, of people taking the name of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in vain. On Friday, the President of the United States of America made this declaration. Today we celebrate Dr. King for standing up for the self-evident truth Americans hold so dear that no matter the color of our skin, or the place of our birth. We are all created equal by God. Just one day before, this same president of the same United States used a phrase in reference to Haiti and African nations that I do not feel comfortable sharing in church during worship. And just to make his meaning crystal clear, he added that instead of welcoming immigrants from these countries to America, he would prefer to see America accept immigrants from countries like Norway. Norway, of course, being a country whose social values and governmental policies are completely antithetical to everything this president's administration has so far stood for, which then forces us to ask, so what is it about Norwegians that our president values so much? And conversely, what is it about Haitians and Africans that he so despises? What, what is the significant difference between these peoples? Also on Friday, the city of Jacksonville, led by its mayor, celebrated its 31st annual Martin Luther King Jr. breakfast. But noticeably absent from the celebration of Dr. King were two of the city's most important black-led civil rights groups, the Jacksonville chapters of the NAACP and the SCLC. Now, most of us are probably knowledgeable of the NAACP, but some of us may not be quite as familiar with the SCLC. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference was founded in 1957 following the successful Montgomery bus boycott in order to coordinate the action of local protest groups throughout the South. I'll give you one guess as to who the SCLC's first president was. It was King. The NAACP and the SCLC were not present at the mayor's MLK breakfast on Friday because they were boycotting it in protest. Back in November, the group co-signed a letter to the mayor informing him that they would not be attending this year because of, quote, the current absence of respectful discourse around civil rights, economic rights, human rights, and our lack of inclusion in the planning of this MLK breakfast. The letter went on to state, for our organizations to participate in this event without a real seat at the table 
is disrespectful to the memory of Dr. King. The mayor decided to have the breakfast anyway. You know, the word irony gets thrown around a lot, but it doesn't get more tragically ironic than this. A public celebration of the legacy of MLK, coordinated by a white mayor and predominantly white city leadership, ignoring accusations of racism from two prominent black civil rights organizations, one of which was actually founded by Dr. King himself, leading to their protest and boycott of the event, an event, remember, that was supposed to celebrate the most successful boycotter and protester of racism in American history. Welcome to Jacksonville. As an aside, I'd like to note that for the first time in many years, UUCJ did not purchase a table at the city's MLK breakfast this year. We chose rather to be in solidarity with the NAACP and the SCLC. And the money that we would have used to purchase that table will instead be donated directly to those two organizations. These recent incidents of Dr. King's name being taken in vain is precisely the kind of nonsense that occurs when white people in power refuse to share that power with people of color. This is what happens when people of color are simply used by white people as diversity tokens. And it just so happens that there was a third example of this occurring just this past week, this week in which we were supposed to be celebrating all the alleged progress that we as a society have made in racial justice and racial equality. The clothing retailer H&M put out an ad this week, this past week, featuring a young black child. The young black child was wearing an H&M hoodie with the following words on it coolest monkey in the jungle. Now, did H&M intend to apply a dehumanizing racial slur toward a black child in their advertisement? I don't know. But their intent, frankly, is irrelevant. In their apology statement, H&M claimed to value diversity and inclusion. But if H&M honestly didn't know that calling a black child a monkey is racist and hurtful, then it means one of two things. Either the white people running this company are blissfully and quite possibly willfully ignorant of what is hurtful to black people, and or H&M doesn't have enough black people in positions of authority in their company to make sure that ignorant and racist stuff like this doesn't happen, especially when they're attempting to market their products towards black people. This week leading up to MLK Day has proven something quite clear. Many white people simply don't know how not to hurt black people. And sadly, most of them don't care to learn how to stop. With what I'm about to say, I do not mean to diminish the threat and harm caused to black people and other people of color by intentional racists such as the KKK or the alt-right. But I am led to believe that right now, the greatest threat to people of color, greater because it is so widespread, the greater threat is that threat from well-intentioned but blissfully ignorant white folks who can't help but repeatedly hurt and offend and ignore. And this type of willful ignorance transcends both political party and religious affiliation. We are not pure in this conversation ourselves. We saw what happened to our own Unitarian Universalist Association last year when we had to work through a painful and hurtful investigation of racially discriminatory hiring practices at the highest level of our denomination. I also recently became aware of a predominantly white UU congregation that invited a local black-led organization to speak at their church. The black organization flatly declined when pressed for a reason why, the black leaders said that they did not feel safe in that congregation's midst. Even well-meaning, good white liberals repeatedly hurt, offend, and disappoint people of color. 
And until we're willing to do the hard work necessary to learn how to stop doing this, until we educate ourselves about how to appropriately share space with people from different backgrounds in an appropriate way for 2018, people of color will not want to come into our predominantly white spaces, no matter how much we clamor about valuing diversity. We must each come to grips with this difficult and unsavory fact. If you are an American, you have been inculcated from birth in ways both explicit and subtle to view and treat people of color as being less than white people. But I'm also here to tell you, it's not your fault. Do not feel any sort of guilt about this. You didn't cause this to happen. But I will also say that if you want to see the fullness of beloved community happen in your lifetime, then you've got to be willing to do something about it. And it starts with self-education, but it will end when we finally make substantive changes to the very structures of our society, when we finally and completely tear down systems of racist oppression, that was Dr. King's dream. And today is a great day to start. You know, today, here at this Jacksonville church, we're celebrating three things. The justice work of eye care, Dr. King's legacy, and NFL playoff football. They are all connected. Y'all remember Colin Kaepernick, right? Uh, even if you're not a football fan, just if you don't know, he was the NFL quarterback who in 2016 protested by taking a knee during the national anthem before football games. Uh, and you may recall this resulted in a lot of white people losing their minds. Um, <laughs> Which is funny because it was like the least threatening, most unobtrusive racial protest in the history of America. And I mean that quite literally. There was no violence. There was no property damage. No disruption caused whatsoever to white people's daily lives. No bridges were shut down. No highways closed. No lunch counters occupied. Kaepernick didn't even break the law which means that the police weren't even bothered to have to handcuff him or fill out arrest paperwork, which they had to do 30 times with Dr. King over the course of his life. And in terms of size, Kaepernick's protest was one person, just him, much smaller than the quarter million people who marched on Washington or even the thousands who boycotted Montgomery buses. It was one person kneeling on the ground while a song played that happened before, not even during, a recreational ball game during a part of a telecast that nobody watches. And predictably, all hell broke loose. The NFL lost viewers, the president attacked the NFL, the pizza guy lost his job. Um, but lost in all of this, for many, was the original reason why Colin Kaepernick began his protest. And in understanding the meaning of his protest, I think it best to look at his own words rather than listening to those who had presumed to speak for him. Kaepernick himself said he protested because of America's treatment of African Americans and other minorities, specifically citing, quote, bodies in the street and people getting paid leave and getting away with murder. To draw the point finer, Following a game in early 2016, Kaepernick said, I can't see another Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, Walter Scott, Eric Garner. At what point do we take a stand and as a people say, this isn't right? From the beginning, Kaepernick's protest was always about racially motivated police brutality. Now critiquing the American system of policing is a thin blue line that even many good white liberals refuse to cross. Even though it was a theme in many of Dr. King's speeches and sermons, it appeared, for example, in his most famous speech, right before he uttered the words, I have a dream. Dr. King rhetorically asked his audience at the March on Washington 
When will the devotees of civil rights be satisfied? And he went on to give a long list of demands which included desegregation, the right to vote, the right to move freely across this country. But the very first demand that MLK made listed before all those other demands was an end to police violence against black people. He said this, quote, we can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. In the prophetic spirit of Dr. King, Colin Kaepernick has been using his platform to protest the treatment of black Americans at the hands of police. The relatively recent inventions of the cell phone and social media have finally allowed the rest of America to glimpse what Dr. King and other black leaders have been decrying for decades, centuries, really. And Jacksonville is not immune. Many of us have likely seen the recently published report that demonstrated pretty conclusively that black pedestrians in Jacksonville are three times more likely to be cited by JSO than white pedestrians. But of course, that's just the tip of the iceberg. At the end of 2017, in our I Care House meetings, we all heard stories, unspeakably horrible stories, tragic stories, of racially motivated police misconduct. I personally heard stories from men and women in this city brutalized by police, men and women who were not even suspects of a crime. And what we heard loud and clear is that there are broad swaths of people in our city who are scared to even call the police to report a crime. And so that is why iCare's new issue beginning this year is going to involve how we as a community address police misconduct in Jacksonville. It is an inherently controversial topic. We all saw what it did to the NFL and the rest of the country over these past few years. But we cannot in good conscience allow fear of controversy to stop us from pursuing justice. But I will also say this, in our pursuit of justice, we will not crucify police officers. Many of the best, most upstanding, honorable people I have met in my life are police officers. Police officers have perhaps the hardest job in this nation, and we will not seek to demonize or in any other way dehumanize the good people who serve to protect our communities. Many of these individuals, through no fault of their own, happen to find themselves in the midst of a system that lacks accountability and safeguards. And without that accountability, without those safeguards, trust erodes, relationships falter. So it is our duty to help rebuild trust between the people and the police because in the end, that helps every single one of us, including and especially police officers who put their lives on the line every day at every traffic stop, at every interaction with civilians. Justice is always in the best interests of all of us. As Dr. King so eloquently reminded us, we are tied together in the single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, and whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And that is the reason why in the midst of our fight against all forms of racism, including racial profiling and police brutality, we Unitarian Universalists must never succumb to the temptation of dehumanizing our opponents. The great evil of racism is that it dehumanizes people. It suggests that only white people deserve to be treated as fully human. So racism, of course, dehumanizes its victims, but racism also dehumanizes its perpetrators. Racism impoverishes the souls of white folks because it blinds us from ever being able to see the full humanity of other people. 
and thus racism acts as a bar that prevents us from engaging in true and authentic relationships with other people as equals. But life is full of such relationships. Life is nothing but those kinds of relationships. So our fight against racism is nothing less than a fight to liberate ourselves from the invisible chains that take away the fullness of our humanity and the humanity of those who oppress. So although they attempt to dehumanize others, we cannot, through our resistance, dehumanize those we oppose. A black womanist activist, Audre Lorde, famously wrote, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. We must fight hate with love. We must fight dehumanization with rehumanization. And if we cannot truly love our enemies in this movement of resistance, then we are not worthy to carry the name Unitarian Universalist, particularly the last part of that name. Our universalist heritage claimed that divine love is too big to be overcome, too powerful to fail, and that all God's children will one day find redemption. If in our fight we lose sight of the inherent worth and dignity of everyone, including our opponents, then we will have taken our own name in vain. So as we stride into 2018, as we gird up to tear down systems of racism across our city and nation, I'd like to encourage you with these words. Let your resistance be fierce. Let your love be relentless. And never forget that our destinies are all tied together. None are free until all are free. Amen and blessed be.